in session. This is part two for March 4th. This is actually the March 4th, 2021 agenda, planning board agenda. So um, we had a full morning already. Um, I've already made announcements at the beginning of the open meeting, so I'm not going to start all over again, except to say that we have our full complement, um, our full planning board. We have uh, Vice Chair Bailey, Commissioner Washington, uh, Commissioner Geraldo, and Commissioner Dorner. We have our Chief of Development Review, um, James Hunt. We have our uh, Planning Director, Ms. Checkley, here. We have our different technical hearing writer today for the March 4th agenda, um, Marie Proctor. We have Kenny Flanagan over here, senior planner, over here working on the PowerPoints and whatnot. And we have our visual media specialist, Ryan Cron, and also our uh, planning board administrator. So here, present um, and accounted for. Um, we do have a little glitch here, so I'll probably take a break after, um, after one or two of our afternoon cases. And I won't make the same announcements except to say that it is Women's History Month and we want to celebrate all the women in our lives. And I'm starting by honoring those who passed on and honoring the women on our planning board and in the commission um, and in our viewing audience. Um, and then the other two things I would say, again, just because we believe in celebrating to the hilt, I would say happy birthday to our own uh, Peter Goldsmith, our senior legal counsel and uh, who's just celebrated a birthday and happy birthday to our leap year baby, our quintessential motion maker, Commissioner Shawnice Washington. So happy birthday everyone. And with that, I am going to proceed with our afternoon agenda. The first item on our afternoon agenda is the uh, consent agenda. So is there anyone here to oppose the staff's recommendations on items 4A through 4F or any board member who wishes to discuss and before I before you make a motion um, I do have people who are signed up and hopefully it's only if there are any questions but maybe not because I see Mr. Rivera has you know has his camera on so Mr. Rivera you have signed up on item 4f um, yes just here for questions madam chair okay just if there are any questions okay and on item 4D, we had four people signed up on that. And that, and, and Mr. Flanagan, you need to get ready for that. Um, that would be Mr. Tedesco. No, no, Good afternoon, sorry. Madam Chair. I, I'm here. I, we signed up just in the abundance of caution. But as you know, the, um, the board doesn't actually have any authority to have a hearing on special exceptions, but we're here if should there be any questions. Okay, got it. And so that would be Ms. And that's Ms. Shum as well. She let the record reflect that she signed up. And Ms. Bader. Okay. So, all right. So, with that, um, no one's speaking. So, with that, I'm going to now entertain a motion on the consent agenda. Madam Chair, after consideration of the records for the items 4A through 4F, I move adoption of staff findings and approval of the items on the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendation of staff. Second. We have a motion by um, Madam Vice Chair, seconded by Commissioner Washington. Madam Vice Chair. Vote aye. Commissioner Washington. Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner. Vote aye. Commissioner Geraldo. You're muted. Aye. Okay, aye. I okay. vote aye. Okay, so the ayes had it at 5-0. Our next case is item eight, which is the details site plan 14028-04. Um, it's the University of Maryland Capital Regional, Regional Medical Center, Capital Region Medical Center. Um, Mr. Zeng, are you on? Yes, good afternoon, my venture and members of the planning board. This is Henry Zeng. Okay. I, I don't know if that's your phone, but we're having a feedback problem. Um, Mr. Ship, are you on? I am. Wonderful. Um, Mr. Bickle? I'm present. Wonderful. Laura Kautz. Present. Did I pronounce it correctly? Probably not. No, yes, you did. That's, okay. your, that's a first. Okay, well, wonderful. Thank you. It could happen every once in a while. Okay. Um, this, Mr. Uh, and that concludes our sign up list. Mr. Zhang, you are on. Muted. Yeah, Mr. I can't, Mr. Zhang. 
Mr. Zhang, you're definitely muted. Oh, Mr. Zhang. Sorry for that. Okay, no worries. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and the Good members of the planning board. For the record, this is Henry Zhang with the design section. Uh, item eight in front of you is a limited uh, detailed site plan uh, confined to the comprehensive signage plan for Prince of George's County Regional Hospital, uh, currently known as University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Mr. Flanagan, he's working on it. Next one after that. Okay, is that what you want, Mr. Mr. Zhang? Next, please. Next slide, please. Keep going. Yeah, the, the subject side is in Plenty Area 73, Council District 6. Next slide, please. Uh, specifically, the site is located on the south side of Medical Center Drive. Mr. Zhang. Are you fading out, Mr. Zhang? Something's... His what? Your audio is off, Mr. Zhang. How do we how do we straighten that out? Can you mute me? Mr. Zhang, um, you're having computer issues, I think. So you may have to call in. I don't know if he can hear me. Maybe he can't hear me. Are you calling him? It looks like his microphone button came back. So it might okay. be not that to unmute him. It, it was actually grayed out before. Okay. Mr. Zhang? Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now for that i don't know what's going on <laughs> this is, okay uh, this side as outlined in red uh this is the subject side it's on the uh, south side of uh uh medical center drive next slide please next slide please yeah so uh next slide please so it's not the one with the purple, with the with the zones, with the zoning categories. No, I I, I saw the site vicinity map. Next slide, please. We're on the zoning map. Is that the one that you're looking for? No. We were wondering if he wasn't. No, next, just keep the. What slide? What's what's the label on the slide that you want? What's the number? Mr. Zhang? He's muted again. Can you, can you, can you unmute me? Can you mute me? Let me back on. Mr. Zhang, you are muted. You have to unmute yourself. Okay. All right, we're going to go to another case. It might be where he's sitting, wherever he is. Which they told me in my house, too, they were telling me. Um, and Mr. Ed, if you can hear me. Ma Madam Chair, this is James Hunt. I just called Henry. He's going to call in right now. That's what I'm asking, but I can take another case, you know, I, I. Yes, go ahead and take, go ahead and take another case and we can come back to that. That's fine. 
Okay, thank you. So we're going to temp pass this case temporarily and we're gonna to go to another one. We're, um, I think the thing we will go to now is item. Um, is he on the phone now? Mute him. That means he's on. Okay, um, all right. Mr. Hunt, you will take care of the Mr. Zhang situation. I am going to go, to, I'm going to call, um, I'm going to put, I'm going to go to item six and seven. Item six and seven is Chesapeake Bay Critical Area Conservation Plan, Alice Ferguson Foundation Hard Bargain Farm. Um, can you mute? Okay, and then and then hold on a second. I'm gonna make sure we have everyone that we need. Okay, we see Mr. Sievers there. He's yes, ma'am, present. Wonderful. Nate Foreman, are you on? Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm on. Wonderful. There you are. Okay, Karen Miles. Karen Miles. I, I am here. A, wonderful. Um, Peter Soprano. I'm here. Hakeem Wilson. I'm here as well. Okay, and Kevin Riley. Uh, Madam Chair, Kevin Riley will not be able to make it to, to the hearing okay. today. Okay, okay, fine. But site resources is fully represented. <laughs> okay, okay. And that concludes my sign up list. Mr. Sievers, you are on. All right, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am Thomas Sievers, Senior Planner with the Zoning Section. Item number six and seven on the agenda is a revision of site plan uh, for and um, a revision to a conservation plan as well for Alice Ferguson Hard Bargain Farm, uh, ROSP-4663-02 and CP-10005-01. The application consists of a revision to remove a previously approved 12,240 square foot educational building and replace it with a 2,400 square foot or 60 by 40 uh, open air pavilion and associated parking modifications. Uh, please note that a revision to the site plan was accepted because the proposed building and use are significantly less intensive than the original approval. Slide two, please. The site is located in the southwestern part of Prince George's County within planning area 83 and council district nine. Slide three, please. More specifically, the site is located on the northeast and southwest sides of Bryan Point Road, approximately 2.4 miles west of Farmington Road. Slide four, please. The site is located in the OS open space zone and RCO resource conservation overlay of the CBCA. The property is bound to the east by undeveloped land in the OS zone, to the south by Bryan Point Road, additional undeveloped land owned by the applicant and single family residences in the OS zone, to the west by the Wagner Community Center and pool in the OS zone, and to the north by Piscataway Park in the ROS reserved open space zone. Slide five, please. The overlay map shows uh, the portion of the site located within the CBCA resource conservation overlay. Slide six, please. The aerial photograph shows that the subject site contains numerous structures and outbuildings. Slide seven, please. The site map shows that the topography on the site is varied with a prominent central bluff. Slide eight, please. This slide shows the revisions made to the existing site plan. Revisions include the replacement of the educational building with a 2,400 square foot open air pavilion, modifications to the circular drive and the relocation and reduction of required parking spaces. Slide nine, please. This slide shows the revisions to the conservation plan. Slide 10, please. This slide shows the revisions to the buffer management plan. Slide 11, please. 
Lastly, this slide shows the final layout of the proposed revisions. In conclusion, the zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve Alice Ferguson Foundation slash Hard Bargain Farm uh, ROSP-4663-02 and CP-10005-01 subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Sievers. Um, let's see if there are any questions of you at this time. Okay, Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time, thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Commissioner Dorner. No questions. Commissioner Geraldo. No questions, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Mr. Foreman. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the planning board. My name is Nate Foreman. I'm an attorney with O'Malley, Miles, Nyland, and Gilmore. This office is in Greenbelt. Um, I'd like to thank staff for their hard work and help on this uh, project and uh, would like the uh, board to know that we are in agreement with staff's recommended conditions and would request that the planning board uh, approve this project. Um, I'm here with um, Karen Miles on behalf of the owner. Uh, Hakeem Wilson and Kevin Soprano from Site Resources, and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions the board might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Foreman. And are you indicating that Ms. Miles, Mr. Soprano, and Mr. Wilson are here for questions only? Uh, that, that is correct, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so let's see if the board has any questions of anyone. Okay, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, but it's always good to see the uh, Foundation. It is. Alice, some, some of us had children who spent a lot of time there. <laughs> yeah. um, Commissioner Geraldo. I second. I second, uh, Madam Commissioner, Vice Chair Bailey's comments about thank the foundation. Uh, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner. No questions. Thanks. Um. So, okay, okay, so that so there are no questions here. And you know, and 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 the farm really is very, very, very nice. And I remember and the turkeys, I would just remember so many. It's just beautiful. It's just so quaint. And it's a nice drive to get there too. Oh yes. Um, and uh, so is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve ROSP-4663-02 and CP-10005-01 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report. Second. We have a motion we have a motion from Commissioner Washington seconded by Vice um Vice Chair Bailey. Um Madam Vice Chair, but I Commissioner Washington, but I Commissioner Dorner, I Commissioner Geraldo. Vote aye, Madam Chair. The ayes have it 5-0. And I would just ask Mr. Foreman if you deliberately mess with Mr. Zhang's computer so that you could beat out um, Mr. Ship in, in, in order of uh, cases today. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you, Madam Chair. You're, you're fading out. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure I am. OK, that's a good answer. Good answer. Thank, okay. thank okay. you very much. Have a great day. Thank, thank you so very much. Okay, we. I understand that. Um, can you move me first? Um, have our. We have some of our technical difficulties straightened out on this end, and some. And Mr. Zhang, I think you're straight too. Okay, so we're going to go back to item um, eight, which was detailed site plan one four zero two eight dash oh four, the University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center. Uh, Mr. Zhang, you're on. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Good you know, Madam Chair and members of the planning board. Start with the uh, uh, next slide, please. How far do you want them to go? Next slide, please. Right there. Uh, you you want me to start it if I'm here? I can I can yeah I can just start it from here. Yeah, the, the subject side is in planning area 73, council district six. Next slide, please. Uh, 
the site is uh, on the south side of Medical Center Drive, the southeast corner of its intersection with Hillman Drive. And as outlined in red on this slide, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, the site is the MXT zone, which is mixed use transportation oriented zone. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, this the site also is within the development district overlay zone of the Largo Town Center plan. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, slide seven. Okay. Okay. Uh, I can, okay. I, I can't, I can, sh I can, sh okay. Uh, this, the site basically general leveled uh, with the building already uh, constructed. Next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Mr. Zhang, it appears that when we, when um, the, we're moving to the next slide, there's a delay when when it shows up on your computer. So sometimes you may need to announce what the number of the slide that you want to see. Okay. Okay. Uh. Okay. Okay. Um. Uh, this. This Massman roadway shows both the Medical Center Drive and road uh, arterial roadway. Next, please. Uh, this shows the site with the Fargo Town Center uh, transit or involvement for a metro station is right in the middle of the site. Next slide, please. Slide number 10 basically shows the previously approved detailed site plan. Uh, you, should, you, you see the hospital building complex is in the middle of the site. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the, the, the site plan, uh, signage plan, which shows the location of a different type of the signage. This, okay, the signage plan, okay. And Mr. Yeah, Zhang? This okay. basically is a, yes. Uh, it's a comprehensive signage plan. We include all uh, monumental sign and uh, wayfinding signs, and only one building mounted signs included in its detailed site. Next slide, please. Uh, this exhibit showed the previously approved building uh, plan. This is the original uh, plan. Shows the main elevation of the hospital building. Uh, you see the signage on top of the building. Next slide, please. Uh, this signage signage type plan will show what has been included uh, in this uh, application. Uh, specifically, on the top are the three uh, monumental signs. And then below are the small monumental sign and as well as the wayfinding sign, directional sign. Next slide, please. Uh, there the three monumental sign, one is located at the uh, in the center of Medical Center Drive and uh, Foot Road. Next slide, please. And, and then the, the other two monumental signs, which located 
uh, behind the parking garage uh, on the main uh, access road to emergency portion of next slide, please. Uh, this is the only uh, building mounted signage proposed uh, in this DSP, uh, which will be located in the parking garage uh, at the intersection of Lossford Road and Medical Center Drive. Next slide, please. Uh, the following uh, slides, uh, 17 to uh, 19, will be the uh, image for the proposed three uh, monumental signage. Just um, keep uh, going. And then uh, in order for those three uh, monumental signs to be installed uh, on this property, uh, the applicant need to amend the signage design criteria of the development district overlay zone. And uh, on page staff report page 67, uh, there is a detailed discussion on the, how the alternative signage will benefit the development while not substantially impair the implementation of the Largo Town Center sector plan. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this will be the last uh, uh, slideshow, which shows a couple of wayfinding signs, also slightly larger the permissible design standard. Uh, staff also has a discussion on page uh, 8 of the staff report. Uh, given the overall limited scope of this revision, uh, previous to finding regarding uh, conformance with zoning ordinance, uh, previous uh, approval conditions, uh, landscape menu, woodland and wildlife habitat conservation ordinance, as well as tree canopy coverage ordinance uh, will not be uh, impacted. The finding was say uh, valid and governing. Uh, no citizen opposition received during the review process and uh, no agency opposed to um, the approval of this uh, detailed site plan limited to the comprehensive uh, sign package. Uh, the urban design section recommends that the planning board adopt the finding of this report uh, approved alternative uh, freestanding uh, sign standards for three monumental signs which are taller than the DDOZ standards for two monumental signs which has a sign face areas uh, larger than the, than the, by the uh, DDOZ standards. And then further approved detail type plan DSP 14028-04 for um, Prince George's County Regional Hospital, which currently known as University of Maryland Capital Region Medical Center, uh, with one condition. This concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zhang. Let's see if there are any questions of you before I get to. Okay, somebody's talking. Okay, before I get to um, Mr. Ship. So, Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Washington? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. Commissioner Geraldo? I have no questions, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ship? Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. For the record, William Ship with law offices in Greenbelt. It's my pleasure to follow my newest partner, Nate Foreman. Oh, it's a new partner. I was, I was wondering. We would have said that we would have made a big deal. Okay. Yeah. You'll, so he'll be back. Don't worry. Okay. Um, but, but I do have a question for you. Um, I'm, you know, when you get to it, um, you're probably going to explain it because I'm looking at the signage on slide 12 and then slide 13. And I know we're changing names. So I hope you address that so everybody's really clear on on Prince well, um, Okay. All right. The, the name should be reflected in, in uh, Ms. Katz from the uh, University of Maryland Medical System can comment, but as the Capital Region Medical Center. Okay. Um, the purpose of the graphics obviously is to show the design we've been in um, 
draft for some time. Uh, and then one the, was previously approved. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yes. And I will say that at the outset, we completely agree with staff recommendations and proposed conditions. The uh, approval of the signage package was actually delegated by the planning board to urban design staff in the original approval. But since we were asking for modification of some of the standards in the sector plan, everybody felt it was best to put it on an agenda. But I won't uh, belabor going through it, all other than to say that this is a very important component of our race to the home stretch to get the hospital open, which is on schedule for June 12th of this year. Uh, Laura is here uh, primarily to, to answer any questions in case you want an update on how it's going with the hospital. But the signage obviously is very important to uh, implement the ability for people to find their way once they get there. The only other thing I would add is that um, the signage package for the hospital does not in any way preclude our ability to work with the Largo Town Center Wayfinding uh, Task Force, which is underway uh, with Park and Planning. I've, met, I've uh, spoken with your staff on that and expressed that our client is more than willing to uh, cooperate and find ways to incorporate any kind of wayfinding or, or town center theme signage that comes in with the the town center. Uh, but obviously we have to get ready to open and we need people to be able to find their way and not get confused, especially when they might be, you know, otherwise uh, stressed or, or emotionally um, uh, challenged that they need to make sure they can get to the right place as quickly as possible. With that, I'm, I'm ready to answer any questions you might have. I have David Bickle from Soltes and Laura Couts from uh, the University of Maryland Medical System. Okay, thank you, Mr. Ship. I'm gonna see if there are any questions. I will tell you, I pass by all the time and I just marvel at, and, and I'm so excited. It's It's been a, a long time coming and I'm so thrilled and I'm so thrilled for the residents of Prince George's County. We so deserve this and we're so excited and to address, you know, I mean, it, it's gonna be a teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Maryland. It just doesn't get any better than that. And our residents truly deserve this. And I know this is about signage for today, but right. um, we are excited. And there may be questions about how it's coming along. And, and um, so let's see right now if there's any questions, but you know, some of us just can't wait. Okay, Madam Vice Chair. I agree, some of us can't wait and we'll be glad when it's there because some of us are having trouble driving and looking at the same time, but uh, that's, not, that's not the that's not the hospital problem. But some of us have short attention spans, and we're looking because we're so excited about seeing everything. But no, I don't have any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Washington. No, uh, I would just so you know, stop, stop Commissioner Washington for a second. I'm going to mute everybody when one person's speaking because we were getting some feedback. Okay, Commissioner Washington. No, I was just going to associate myself with uh, your comments as well as Vice Chair Bailey's. Um, and I, I too would like clarity on the um, slides 12 and 13 because I noticed that as well. And I guess that's going to be addressed by the University of Maryland. Yeah, I think I think so. But one one was what was already approved. Number one, number right. twelve was yeah. But, yeah, but, we, but I'd love to hear. From, we'll hear from them as well because I'm I'm sure we're anxious to hear from them. Did, did you have any other questions, Commissioner Washington? I did not. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. Yeah, no. Excited to see um, this facility come underway and and good work on on getting all the way through. Um, the one just comment, not not a question or anything, but just the comment is to be careful with um, internal signage and making sure that it's bilingual. Um, I, I have the unfortunate experience of having spent about seven months out of the last year and a half or so in hospitals. Um, and I've been over and over again, um, Latino folks who were in the hospitals not being able to find um, where they're trying to go, even though the words are, are fair, there's a lot of cognates in most of these words. But even so, they, they had trouble kind of locating that just kind of adds stress to their, their situations when they're already in there. Um, so to the extent interior that you can provide bilingual or other kind of um, services, that would be very helpful, I think. Good point. And Commissioner Geraldo. 
I agree with uh, and share in the comments of all the other commissioners. And I just think it's it's a long time that we have will have social equity with regards to Maryland and Prince George's County. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, uh, uh, Mr. Ship, is there someone uh, uh, that you would prefer to speak right now at this point? Well, it, would it be Ms. Cox? Well, I, I don't want to throw Laura on the bus on this. If you want to pull up slide 12 and 13 we could look at it and and maybe i can comment on um yeah. what you observed phil i'd be happy right. to answer their questions okay <laughs> it's a little harder when you're not sitting right next to each other to to yeah. look at your client and say are you okay hey, hey, with that hey, mr ship mr ship it's women's history month she's got this okay yeah. oh she's got it i know that okay absolutely um, thank you very much uh, for all your comments. I really appreciate uh, all the wonderful things you've said about the hospital. Um, the name change uh, is related to um, a process that we go through every time we acquire a new hospital. Uh, we like our hospitals to reflect the region that they are in. So, for instance, when we purchased Anne Arundel Commu uh, uh, Medical Center, its name changed to Baltimore Washington Medical Center. Okay. Uh, similarly, with Midtown, um, we changed the name to UMMC Midtown Campus. It had been Maryland General, likewise with several of our other hospitals. So that was the reason for the name change. Um, I will say originally, um, Prince George's Medical Center was simply a placeholder. We knew the name would change. We didn't know what it would be. This made sense. Um, so it was always our intention to come back with a new name um, and show you. And we landed on Capital Region Medical Center. Okay, wonderful. Um, so one comment regarding the internal wayfinding as well. Um, we have uh, established all of the wayfinding signs. Um, they have They are written in English, but every sign has an international symbol associated with uh, that service. So for example, the imaging department has a, a picture of an x-ray and it's a very simple, you know, a drawing a diagram of what it is that we're talking about. Um, but it serves as sort of a, the an easy methodology for any language to understand where it is they're heading. Also at the front desk, we'll have printed out copies of what the symbols mean in various languages. So if they see that x-ray and they don't understand what that means, you can pick up a little piece of paper that identifies the name in your language. If that makes Thank sense. You. Thank you. Let's see if there are any questions of you. I'll start with uh, Mr. Dorner, Commissioner Dorner, who asked the question. No, I think that's great because it's not just Hispanics that are um, here. Like there's a lot of Middle Eastern folks as well um, walking around the hospitals and stuff. and. And I think the international symbols is, is the way to go. Um, you probably need to have plenty of translators on, on call, but um, good luck. I hope that this is really successful. The, the level of care is, is, is great that this hospital is going to be bringing. I'm very excited about that. Thank you very much. And I'll tell you, the inside is even more beautiful than the exterior. Wonderful. Okay, so let's see, um, uh, Commissioner Bailey, I mean, Vice Chair Bailey, do you have any questions? You're muted. He's muted. I see. Okay. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Washington. No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Geraldo. No questions and welcome to Prince George's County. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, there you have enthusiasm from our board and let's see if we can translate that into a motion. <laughs> Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the alternate development district standard A1 as outlined in staff's report. In addition to approving DSP-14028-04, along with the associated condition as outlined in staff's report. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. Vote aye. Commissioner Washington. Vote aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye.
Commissioner Geraldo. Vote aye, Madam Chair. And the ayes have it um, unanimously. So way to go. We can't wait. I'm going to keep driving by. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Madam <laughs> Chair. If I could um, uh, make one comment of uh, question and one matter of privilege. Um, we were trying to get these signs moving, so I certainly appreciate staff's help and I know they're working on a resolution. We hope that could get back to you pretty quickly. Oh, uh, so we, we have our get... planning director right here and she's hearing and we'll uh, done. Consider it done. And then the, ma the matter of privilege, I mentioned that Mr. Foreman was our newest partner, but actually there are two other uh, additional partners uh, that are very appropriate for uh, Women's History Month. Um, we've got Kate Pruitt and, and also our very own uh, Stephanie Anderson who have also become partners with the firm. Wonderful, wonderful. So, oh. wonderful. Well, you know what, please extend our very best to all three. And I wish I had known that when, when Mr. Foreman was on and, and hopefully he was watching during your case, but we'll see. And um, please extend so. our best to all of them. And a special shout out to um, uh, Stephanie, who was our former Prince George's County attorney. So, thank absolutely. you very much. Thank yes. you. Um, Great. Yeah, Great. thank you. And um, we're going to continue on. We're going to proceed in, um, in this manner. We're going to go with item five um, and then item 10, nine and three A. So item five, I'm going to make sure. Oh, and I was remiss in not announcing before or for our second half, we announced him in the beginning, but we do have our principal counsel with us as well, David Warner. Okay. Um, so item five is the uh, MR Mandatory referral 2101F, uh, Bureau of Engraving and Printing Replacement. Let's check and make sure we have everyone. Ms. Osei. Present. Wonderful. Charles Davis, the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Wonderful. Uh, Joseph uh, Rucco. I, I, I know I'm messing it up. No, you did, did great. Present. Thank you. Okay. So do you want to pronounce it for me one time just to make sure? Sure. Rucco. Oh, it is Ruka. Okay, there we go. Uh oh, I'm gonna mess it up again. Helga Westgate. Westgate. Yes. Okay. Helga I, I, Westgate. I respond to anything that's close. Yes, Helga Westgate. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, Maryland Department of Commerce. Um, Loveline Perkins. Yes, I'm present. Bansville Heights Citizens Association. Um, those are our proponents. Our opponents. We have um, Holly Simmons from the City of Greenbelt. Holly Simmons. I can come back to you. We have, um, I, I know I saw Terry Ruby. Yes, here. Thank you. Audio of Greenbelt. Do you happen to know if Ms. Simmons is on? Uh, she, well, she is on, so maybe she's having audio. I'll check with her. Thank okay. you. Um, Melissa Dastin, West Laurel Civic Association. I don't see her name on there. We're going down of the list. Okay. So we also have four exhibits. We have um, three proponent exhibits. We have one from the Vansville Citizens Association that will be proponents exhibit number one. We have a letter from the Maryland Department of Commerce of Support that would be proponents exhibit number two. And then we have um, a letter from Karen Coakley that would be proponents exhibit number three. And then we have a, a, an opponent, opposing letter from the West Laurel Citizens Association. That would be opponents exhibit number one. Okay. And with that, um, I'm going to try one more time for Holly Simmons. She's going to try to call and she's having a, a difficulty. Okay. No worries. Okay. And Melissa Dostin. Okay. Well, all right. So let's go with... Um, Ms. Okay, we're ready for you. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, Vice Chair, members of the board. I'm Christine Osei, Countywide Planning Division. Item five is the proposed Bureau of Engraving and Printing uh, project, mandatory referral application number 2101F by the United States Department of the Treasury. Before I get into this slide presentation, I just have a brief background context so that we can uh, get the flow of the presentation. The application is a referral from the National Capital 
Planning Commission under the procedures of intergovernmental cooperation in federal planning in the national capital region. The project side results from a 20 year planning process by the Department of the Treasury to address deficiencies at the current facility in Washington, DC and modernize current printing operations. The existing Washington, DC facility was built in 1914. The project goal was to relocate a new facility on large parcel of land with direct access to existing highways and aviation network, such as the 105 acre at the Bellsville Agricultural Research Center. The Bureau currently operates two facilities, one in downtown DC and another in Texas, Fort Worth, Texas, and a warehouse in Landover, Maryland. The new facility will replace the existing facility in Washington, DC. DEP current operations is supported by administrative and security functions, approximately 1,600 full-time staff. About 65% of those employees reside in the state of Maryland and 45% live in Prince George's County. The planning department has been involved with this project since 2019. We participated in public scoping meetings, reviewed the draft environmental impact statement and the draft transportation impact study. Slide two, please. The site is located in the northern portion of the county, planning area 62, council district one. It is not within any municipality. Slide three, please. The site is in the reserved open space zone as the rest of the Bellsville Agricultural Center campus. Slide four, please. The site is part of the 200 acre central poultry farm that was a thriving a previously thriving poultry research farm. It is bounded to the north by Odell Road, to the south by Paddle Mill Road, and surrounded by other back facilities. Poultry Road runs north-south through the site from Odell Road and connects to Paddle Mill Road. As you can see, the site is the one highlighted in red. Slide five, please. This is the existing condition on the side as we see a partial view. There are 23 buildings on the side. Poultry Road, as you can see, runs through the side from Odell Road north to Paddle Mill Road to the south. 22 of the 23 buildings will be demolished and the other one will be relocated in another area on the back campus. The wildlife office is the only actively used building on the side. Portions of the 105 acre are cropland, forest, pasture, wetlands, two surface parking lots, and paved and unpaved roads. Approximately 45 acres of the 105 acres will be used for the new facility. Next slide. The proposed transportation improvement study I mentioned in the previous study that our staff participated in in 2020 shows 20, 15 intersections were evaluated. And I'll walk through a little bit on the colors. The blue circle intersections are the ones that do not have traffic lights. The ones in red are the ones that do have traffic lights. And the side is hatched in yellow right south of Odell Road. There's a yellow hatch right, in, that's it. That's the side with poultry road showing running through Odell, which is the road north of the side. And further down, you will see Powder Mill Road runs to number 10, which is the red as the south connection road. Part of milk. Yes, that's it, number 10. So out of the 15 intersections, seven were identified for mitigation for improvements. As outlined in here, 201, uh, Maryland 201, Sunny Avenue, South Maryland 201, Beaver, uh, Beaver Dam, and Maryland 201, Part of Mill Road. One of the concerns that we have with this project at staff level is that the seven intersections uh, the information that was provided to us for review did not contain preliminary design for the seven intersection. The applicant may be able to explain that later, but we're told that this may come later in the project development, in the later phases of the project development. Uh, as you can see on number three is shown as a preliminary design mentioned before, we do not have preliminary design to have commented on the, 17, on the seven intersections that are identified on the slide that I just discussed. The next slide, please. At the environmental future, the site contains wetlands, streams, and woodlands. The Maryland Department of the Environment and the Corps of Engineers will be addressing all the environmental uh, sensitive area impact on the site 
as were identified in the environmental impact study. Next slide, please. As you can see that the environmental impact study has provided guidance for the applicant to begin to isolate some of the sensitive areas that need to be addressed before the development proceeds. And this, this slide shows the sensitive areas that will be looked into as the development falls into place. As I mentioned earlier, the only 45 acres will be disturbed and used for the development for the new facility and the rest of the site will be mitigated to address all the sensitive environmental areas as shown on the slide. Next slide, please. Slide nine. Okay. Uh, this slide um, shows the transportation right away, uh, which is how one of the meets one of the goals for the project to locate the site within a tra access to existing transportation. So I will be able to walk through the poultry road. Uh, the area is shown in blue, and um, Poultry Road is shown running in the middle. North of that is Odell Road, which runs north of the project site. South of that, you have the Green Stem running, which is a collector road, Powder Mill Road. And then on the west side, which is Edmundston Road, on the west side of the site in red is Edmundston Road. So the uh, these intersect the intersection projects that are, the evaluation of the seven intersections that I discussed earlier are part of what fold into the right of way evaluation that need to take place further as the design is a lot, uh, be able to unveil and we will know exactly how the design of those seven will fall into place to be able to give the access that it needs to this side when development commences. Next slide. This is an illustrative site plan, and I just want to back up and say something. The information received for this project uh, was at concept, site, and design level. It did not contain enough information for us to make a comprehensive review. So in my recommendation, I'll be making a request that will ask for a second review referral from the NCPC. So the illustrative plan just shows um, that the BAP will have a primary building approximately 1 million square feet along with series of successive control buildings on the side. And you can see it has a, a uh, the, let's go on the west side. The west has west bombs that show, no, yeah, west of the side, you have a south parking area next to that, which is shown as an arrow. And then you have a truck screening side, which comes either closer to the entrance. There's a visitor uh, also screening area on the east of the side staff screening area, a ring road, an east parking area, and an emergency entrance. This side reflects what the main building would be, but we know that there will be other buildings to decide to be able to contain the, 100, the uh, 1,600 employees. So the entry side that shows the three access for visitor, employee, and tours relate to the main entrance at part of Mill Road, which is a subject of discussion that we did not have a design that outlines how this entryway to the site will be filtered in at that main entrance on part of Mill Road. Next slide. This slide, again, highlights what's discussed under the illustrative site plan shows this, the three access into the area, which is a truck circulation, the staff circulation and the tour circulation. All of this will feature into the visitor entry area, which also directly relates to the Powder Mill Road main entrance. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide shows the exterior building wall, a pedestrian path, and as well as part of portions of the south parking area. Next slide. Uh, this is a north view of the site of the build of the main building, of course, with an institutional sign that says the Bureau of Engraving. Next slide. Uh, this slide shows that the BEP project will be designed to be in harmony with the existing agricultural setting to minimize impact to the surrounding area while supporting a highly efficient modern currency facility. 
The next slide. This also highlights the same goal, to be able to have the main building flush and with the existing agricultural uh, uh, area within Bob. Next slide. Um, this uh, slide shows the Bach property shown in yellow and the northern uh, side, uh, uh, portion of the uh, slide shows Odell Road and the closest community is Advanceville community. So we made a decision at staff level, given the extensive outreach that was done by the applicant in 2019 and 2020, to be able to send notifications to the closest community to the site. And, north, and the north of the site was the Vanceville community. A notice was sent to them early last month, and we did not receive any information from or inquiries from that community, and we presume that they were satisfied with the project. Uh, the applicant's information was inscribed in the notice as well as my contact information as well. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, this is the outreach that the applicant has been engaged with from 2019 to 2021. As I mentioned earlier, our staff has been involved with this project from the beginning. As you can see, on uh, October 2029, the Vanceville community held a town hall meeting with Council Member Donogo to go over the project. And we believe that it, we did not receive inquiry because probably they were satisfied with what was presented to them uh, in 2019. Um, the, in, in February 2020, you can see that NCPC and BAC we are coordinating meetings to discuss exactly how the site will be developed. And that's how the resulted referral was sent to us for review early in January. Next slide. The site is a multi-year, multi-phased, multi-team, complex project. It has several moving parts that is being dealt with at different stages of the development. Um, the second bullet shows that, as I mentioned earlier, we are the concept stage and we did not have enough information and the applicant and the design team did agree that this is the phase where they are they're still evaluating exactly where the siding of the buildings will be located in order to move to the next stage for a preliminary design so the complexity of the project lends itself to be where they are at this point and as i mentioned earlier staff will be requesting the board to approve um, our recommendation asking the referral agency ncpc for the project to be referred to us at a preliminary design stage, which will give us a full review of the site, the location of the buildings, all the amenities on the site, both entrances, and hopefully the seven intersections that are being recommended in the transportation study improvement. Next slide. So this is the project schedule, again, that highlights the complexity and the multi-phase of the project. The blue line in the middle shows that we are at the concept design phase. As I mentioned earlier, not enough information has been generated uh, in terms of the building design, the siding on <coughs> other buildings on the side, the amenities on the side, the entrances to the side, the fencing, the gates, the guard houses, all that they don't have it at this point. They're showing that they, by, they will have 65% 60 uh, design at some point. Again, it falls into our request to be able to review the plan, the site at 60, 35% or higher. That will have all the information we need to be able to comprehensively uh, review this uh, application. As you can see on this slide, it's a nine year project process from 2020 to 2029. And it will take two years to relocate everyone from Washington DC into the new building once the building is built. Next slide, please. Uh, there are permitting agencies that will review uh, the um, development as in most in different phases. As I mentioned earlier, all the environmental issues and sensitive areas on the site will be reviewed by the Maryland Department of the Environment and the Corps of Engineer. That would include the demolishing of the existing buildings that were used for poultry research. And of course, the Maryland Historical Trust is also looking at the impacts on historical resources and cultural view shirts. The Washington Suburban Commission is looking at water access from Odell Road. Currently today, a portion of the site is in Category 6, which does not allow water and sewer connection to the site. So uh, they are requesting a waiver at this point to be able to get access from uh, Odell Road connection to get public water into the site. 
even though bark does have its own water, but it's well water, and we know that the uh, uh, below the engraving, we need a lot of water in its production facility in the main building. So that process is on the work now. Uh, the Prince George's County Public Works uh, will be able to provide access point permits for both Odell and Od um, Potter Mill Road. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, we received information at concept design for the site and the building and didn't have enough information to be able to go a comprehensive review, as mentioned, discussed earlier. We're asking 35% uh, design to be of the project to be referred to us by NCPC. We notified NCPC staff in early, mid-January to inform them of the need for second review, and which will address the site design, the building design, the layout of the buildings, amenities on the site, and the both entrances as well as the main entrance. The emergency access at Odell Road north of the project site and the seven entrances uh, improvement, intersection improvements identified in the transportation improvement study. And so therefore staff is requesting the board to approve the request for a second referral of the proposed BEP project and transmit the staff report to NCPC. This concludes staff presentation and I'll be glad to answer any questions from the board. Thank you. Okay, take a deep breath. <laughs> and thank you, Ms. Oste. I appreciate it. It's a very thorough um, presentation as well. So, um, and it was a lot. And um, so let's <coughs> see if we have questions at this point in time. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, yes, very thorough presentation and I'm still processing it. So I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. <laughs> Um, okay, Commissioner Washington. No questions, but thank you, Ms. Ose. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. No questions, thank you. And Commissioner Geraldo. Ms. Ose, thank you for your uh, thorough presentation, but I have no questions. Okay, um, thank you. So with that, I'm going to go down this list of uh, speakers. Um, and one thing you said, Ms. Osei, you said at the time we hadn't heard from Vanceville, but we have heard from the Vanceville Citizens Association oh. now. Now we, it's, um, they have submit, submitted a letter in support. Um, but I'm going to go down the list of people who have signed up to speak. I'm going to start with Charles Davis from the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. If you wish to speak when I call your name, please start speaking. If you only wish to say you're here for, for questions only, feel free as well. So, Mr. Davis. Uh, yes, good afternoon, Madam Chairman and members of the board. I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of our leadership team at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing. Um, we're happy and pleased to introduce you to a project that has both domestic and international economic uh, implications. You know, the Bureau, the Bureau we produce, uh, we're not the Mint, we produce the cash currency, um, the world's most uh, recognizable banknote. And, you know, as part of that, we have to ensure that it remains the most possible and most secure banknote in the world. And so um, as part of our effort to stay ahead of emerging counterfeit threats, um, the Bureau is in the process of implementing a congressionally authorized uh, program to modernize our facilities and um, cap production capabilities. Uh, the Bureau, you know, as as you've already heard, we've been operating out of our existing District of Columbia facility for more than 100 years. And over the past 20 years, we've been looking at how those facilities could support the future uh, redesign of currency that is currently in the process of, uh, of design. And what we found is unfortunately, our multi-story, um, very aging facilities cannot support the increasingly complex production processes that are required to um, support new currency designs. And, you know, we looked at, we looked at potentially renovating our downtown facilities. Um, we've done multiple studies on that and, um, and it found that it's just not feasible. And that was also validated by the government accountability office, which is kind of the gold standard for uh, planning, you know, planning and oversight of executive um, agencies, executive low agencies. And so because of that, we're looking at implementing a hybrid solution, facility solution, where we keep 
our headquarters functions in our existing facility downtown and relocate our production capabilities and our research and development um, branches and offices and responsibilities to a more secure, smaller, more efficient facility um, else, elsewhere in the national capital region. Um, we've studied multiple locations within the national capital region. We didn't just stumble upon Mark. It was part of a overall multi-year review of uh, both private and federally owned uh, properties. We eventually settled upon federally owned facilities because of the different uh, um, different guidance that we received from um, from the the executive level offices, OMB, and you know different different planning agencies that really want us to reutilize existing federal properties to the greatest extent possible. Um, and so we evaluated these multiple facilities. Um, we had a certain criteria that we went down that's described in the uh, draft EIS that was published um, just a few months ago. And ultimately, um, in coordination with the department and partnership with the United States Department of Agriculture, we recommended moving forward with a, uh, an analysis of a previously developed site that USDA no longer requires. Um, that research has no longer required uh, at BARC and the site has already been previously developed. It's not a greenfield site. And so we uh, we pushed forward with an analysis on, on that site. And then in 2018, um, Congress agreed and provided authority for USDA to transfer this property to the department for the specific purpose of this facility of new production currency facility. And so that's where we are at this point where we have uh, begun design, as you can see, we're in, and have heard we are in the concept stage. Um, and I, you know, we just want you all to know that the Bureau understands and is committed to protecting um, to the extent possible, the historic and environmental features associated with construction of this facility at this site. Um, we've conducted numerous stakeholder outreach activities over the past several years in order to understand the public's concerns associated with this potential project. And we believe our design team is in the process of implementing multiple sustainability initiatives within the building design that will not only benefit the Bureau's production process, our employees, but also the public at large. So with that, I'm open to answering any questions from the board and thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Mr. Davis. Um, and uh, that was actually a very thorough explanation that um, that I found beneficial anyway and helpful to understand. So let's see if the um, other board members have any questions of you. And Ms. Bailey, Madam no Vice questions. Chair. Anybody. Okay, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Commissioner Corner. No, thank you. Commissioner Geraldo. I have no questions, thank you. Okay. So thank you. Um, so uh, Joseph Rucco. <clears throat> yes, uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And uh, thanks Chuck for your explanation. Uh, just to uh, emphasize a couple of minor points uh, on the sustainability aspects of this design. We, we designed several large secure facilities for our federal government and institutional identity is very important. Um, and we have a very firm understanding of the historic nature of this site. And uh, the guiding principle from day one established by BEP leadership was to integrate the program into this pastoral setting, as you saw in the one aerial image that uh, Christine showed you. Um, on the sustainability side, what's interesting about this is um, there is going to be a, uh, a photovoltaic array on the building, which will actually contribute towards approximately 40% of the total uh, power energy requirements of this facility, which is very unique. The other attribute um, is to integrate the project into the, uh, the natural setting. We're actually increasing the uh, tree canopy by approximately 37 acres of additional tree canopy once they're fully mature to, uh, to further protect the, uh, the environment. Um, so um, it's it's a very uh, responsive uh, program to the environment. The other thing too is we really do believe that as you drive along the perimeter of these public roads, be it 
Powder Mill Road, Edmonston Road, or Odell Road, um, you will not see the facility um, because it is so low, low within a landscape. Um, on the western elevation, as Christine pointed out, we have those earth berms. From the top of a berm to the top of that building, it's only 15 feet. And, you know, the homes along Odell to the top of the roof is, uh, you know, they're approximately 25 feet. So we're being very uh, uh, methodical and thoughtful about how we integrate this uh, building into the natural environment. And so with that, um, I, I thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to support this project. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Rucco. Appreciate it. Um, I'm going to turn to the board. Questions? Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Thank you. Commissioner Dorner? No questions, um, but thank you for pointing out the uh, solar array. That That's fantastic to see um, that kind of renewable energy being put into place um, to make it more sustainable development. Thank you. And then um, Commissioner Geraldo. No questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So Helga Weshke, Maryland Department of Commerce. Weshke. Okay. Yeah, very good. Okay. Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah, no. Hey, <laughs> that's better than most. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman and members of the planning board. I represent the Maryland Department of Commerce and we submitted a letter for record and I'm going to outline what that says. I'm the director of federal business relations for the Office of Military and Federal Affairs. I thank you for the opportunity to express our support of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing's proposal to locate the replacement currency production facility on the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center campus. Okay, so Maryland has over 60 federal facilities and 12 major military bases with that also have hundreds and hundreds of defense agencies. My office role is to support grow and advocate for and partner with our federal and military agencies. Just a few examples here in the county is the IRS, Census Bureau, NOAA, and Joint Base Andrews, and they, and employing thousands, thousands. Bringing the 1,600 highly skilled jobs will significantly impact Prince George's County, the region, and the state's economy. The construction of the new technologically advanced currency production operation versus the renovation of an aged facility will result in a cost savings of $600 million to the taxpayers. Also, as mentioned before, the Department of Treasury and the Bureau have a commitment to green development and the design of a sustainable facility. Construction of the building building is expected to employ approximately 1,600 construct I'm sorry 1,700 construction workers, resulting in the estimated total earnings of 105 million over the life of the construction project. These 1,600 employees will have an average salary of $99,000 per employee, resulting in a total earnings of nearly 16 million dollars annually. And as mentioned. With 65% of the current workforce residing in Maryland and 43 living in Prince George's County, these workers will certainly benefit by the relocation of this facility. These employees will also have a positive impact on the local economy as there are 2,000 retailers with 25,000 employees within a five mile radius of Bark. Now, Maryland's support on this project started quite a while ago. In 2018, when Governor Hogan wrote a, to the key congressional leadership to encourage the passage of the bills to authorize the transfer of the land and for the construction of the currency production facility on the BART campus, <clears throat> as Charles mentioned earlier. And in 2019, the Maryland <clears throat> Secretary Kelly Schultz sent a letter of support during the early scoping process. And then last November, Governor Hogan again expressed his support of the relocation during the draft environmental impact statement comment period. So, as you can see, the location of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing production facility in Prince George's County will substantially impact the economy. 
And the governor recognize, recognizes this impact and has encouraged it from the beginning and will encourage it from going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Weschke. Okay, um, I appreciate it. And then I'm gonna keep going down my list. Um, we then had Loveline Perkins from the Vanceville Heights Citizens Association. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Prince George's Planning Board. My name is Loveleen D. Perkins. Today I am honored uh, to speak to you on behalf of Mr. John Perkins, President of the Vanceville Heights Citizens Association Incorporated. He is, of course, unable to be here today, so I'm speaking on his behalf and the Vanceville uh, community. Vanceville Heights Citizens Association is a historic community in Prince George's County. And for statistical purposes, Vansville is part of the Bellsville Census designated place. <clears throat> Vansville, Maryland was officially designated as a historical site by the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission on January 30th, 1973. You may ask why is this a significant? It is significant because the Vansville community historical marker is located, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> located at Odell Road and Old Baltimore Pike, <clears throat> which is within one block of the Beltsville Agricultural Research, Research Center, Bark, and also very, very close to Poetry Road. This is where the Bureau of Engraving and Printing will house this new facility that's scheduled to relocate from downtown DC. Therefore, we have a vested interest in the planning and recommendations that will impact our community and surrounding communities. At the last meeting of the Vansville Heights Citizens Association, we unanimously agreed and will welcome the Bureau of Engraving and Printing to the historic Vansville, Bellsville community. The Vansville Heights Citizens Association is welcoming of the Bureau of Engraving with the understanding that they will work hand in hand with minimum impact to the community they will be a part of. We've met with several representatives of the BEP project and most recently with Mr. Chuck Davis from the facility project management office. He and his team feel that they have a great respect and an interest in maintaining our historic area with a desire to develop a good community working relationship. Additionally, we are encouraged that a great deal of the landscape will remain and also will be enhanced. BEP will reach out to the community for opportunities to share in the actual work they do, offering training and job opportunities will also be available. However, we're not naive and we've discussed and shared our concerns of increased traffic with an already overwhelmed road system with the influx of new and additional employees, traffic will increase no matter the number of various working shifts you may have. Therefore, monitoring of the traffic during the planning stages should be done at peak traffic hours and not off hours. Other areas for continual review are managing hazardous materials, the air quality and proper use of the land, just to name a few. We are asking for a continued review of plans for specific in infrastructure spe uh, improvement for several major roadways in our area that will be critically impacted, including, but not limited to, Edmonston Road, Odell Road, which is currently just a, a very small two-lane highway, Old Baltimore Pike, Powder Mill Road, and Sunnyside Avenue. We are hopeful that our neighboring communities will be as eager to receive the Bureau of Engraving into our area, finding substance and broadening our old and new mutual needs. Vansville Citizens Heights Association Incorporated are encouraged, supportive, and look forward to many opportunities to discuss this project in the very early stages of its progression. There are still many facets to be finalized and we want the very best for our community. Thank you so much for this time to share. Thank you, Ms. Perkins. Um, let's see if there are any questions of you at this time. Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, but I certainly do thank Ms. Perkins for her presentation. Um, Commissioner Washington. 
No questions, but thank you, Ms. Perkins. Welcome. Uh, Commissioner Dorner? No questions, thank you. Um, and Commissioner Geraldo? Perkins, I have no questions, but I thank you so much for coming before the board. Thank you. I think the board has a lot of, I mean, this was determined a historic um, community back in um, the 70s. I think you said 1974 by this commission. None of us were here working for the commission back then. But um, but we are, many of us are familiar with the Vansville area. And it is, I mean, it is a source of pride for us in, in Prince George's County. And I remember, so remember the Coley's, um, uh, uh, Anna and Walter Coley and, and, and how, how much they championed the, the um, Bansville area as well. As just, so um, um, we, we do have a, we do um, recognize the importance of your and historic nature and, and um, um, vigilance of your community. Um, you. So now, okay. So I do have other folks who are signed up to speak. So I'm gonna turn to them as well. I'm gonna start with um, Holly Simmons from the city of Greenbelt. Oh, is that the, is she, did, is she on? Did we work that out? Or I can turn to Ms. Ruby. Let's see if she's on first. Ms. Simmons? I, I am I'm present. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, Holly Simmons, community planner with the city of Greenbelt. I'm speaking on behalf of the Greenbelt City Council, which voted in opposition to this project and which will be submitting a letter outlining the city's concerns shortly. The city believes this industrial facility would not conform to the ROS purpose or uses and would undermine established planning policies at the county level whose intent is to prioritize the preservation of prime agricultural land. The city finds that the project is in direct conflict with the Beltsville Agricultural Research Center 1996 master plan, which states the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission has recognized the importance of BARC as a scenic low density oasis that has, by its function, been spared from development pressures and has recommended a continuation of that existing character in its regional planning efforts. Further, the project site is located within the county's priority preservation area, growth tier four, the plan 2035 rural and agricultural policy area, and the sub-region one master plan rural tier. In summary, the city believes the project will have significant adverse impacts on BARC, the human and natural environment, transportation, and the surrounding community. Thank you for this opportunity to comment and to reaffirm the city's opposition to siting of this development on BARC. Okay, thank you, Ms. Simmons, we appreciate it. Um, now, Ms. Ruby is gonna speak, I'm gonna hold questions since both of you are representing the city of, of, of Greenbelt. So I'm gonna to turn to Ms. Uh, Ruby and then turn to the board to see if they have any questions of either of you, if she's gonna cite the city's position as well. Ms. Ruby? Yes, I'll be, I'll be brief since Ms. Simmons already indicated that the city is opposed to this project. We believe that as an industrial use, it is just not uh, in conformance with any master plan or any recommendations from Mark Bark or the mission of, of Bark. And we have significant concerns about that. We all have spent um, a tremendous amount of time identifying adverse impacts that this project will have on the environment, on traffic, and we believe the neighborhoods surrounding it, as well as the community of Greenbelt. And we will be sharing that information um, with your staff. We would like to ask that in, in the future um, that your, your staff engage the city as it does future, uh, future reviews, if you will, of this project. Unfortunately, we found out about this meeting uh, really just in time to sign up uh, the two of us to speak. Um, so we were not be, we were not able to provide detailed comments uh, to your staff, but we do have them, and we will be doing that, and we uh, will be submitting testimony at, at the uh, NCPC hearing, um, both written and verbal, and we'll share that with your staff as well. I would like, with the board's permission, just to recognize if, if he's here um, in attendance, um, Council Member Rodney Roberts, um, who hopes to join us today, and unfortunately, like I indicated. Oh. We weren't notified of the meeting, so I just want to recognize him if he was here because we were not able to sign him up. Okay, but let me ask this. Uh, you, you can note that he's here, but I can't have, he is precluded from speaking now because he did not sign up with, by our deadline. So um, I, we're, we're precluded from doing that at this juncture, but we, with all due respect, we do recognize um, the councilman um, who, we, who's been a councilman for a good while. So we, I have had lots of experience with him and, and appreciate and value him. 
Um, Thank you. And just in um, conclusion, we would we would like to ask that the planning board join the city in Greenville in its opposition uh, for this project for the reasons that Ms. Simmons and myself stated. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you so very much, Ms. Ruby. I need to um, go back to um, um, Ms. Osei for a second because I'm looking at the staff report and it says there was an acceptance mailing on February 5th, 2021. Was did did um, the city of Greenbelt go overlooked or would you know whether? Um, can you tell? Ta- ta- um, discuss this. We didn't. We looked at the. Um, we decided to mail just to adjoining property owners. Um, the two mile radius was it put them outside the area based on the adjoining uh, okay. adjacent. Right. Okay. Because I, I I see where it is. Right. Okay. Because yep. Potter Road, Road Beltsville. Okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So then I do have um, another speaker. Uh, well, let's see if if our board has any members of uh, any questions of Ms. Uh, Simmons or Ms. Ruby from the city of Greenbelt. Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions, but I would like to thank both of them for coming before us today. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington. Uh, no questions, but my thanks as well. Commissioner Dorner. I want to thank both of you for, for coming. Um, sorry that, that we didn't necessarily get you involved, but you will be involved going forward um, for any other subsequent work because you have signed up um, for, for this particular case. Um, I, the one question I, I did want to know was whether or not the, the property itself is actually within the, the tax authority jurisdiction of the city. I know you don't tax the federal government, but whether or not it actually lies within the city's um, legal boundaries. Um, because yeah. sometimes we get cities that are that are really close that just don't that, that voice opposition or support, um, but the properties don't let, don't technically lie within the legal authority. Uh, Ken, can you go back to slide that shows the Vansville community? I'm not sure what slide is that. Oh, okay, this one. Um, the 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 project area is not within a municipality. It's not even close. And so when we looked at the two mile radius that we do the mailing, it really did not come up. It didn't come up as one of the municipalities to be able to reach out to. Yeah, so I think that's that's not exactly what I'm asking about. Um, uh-huh. It's a slightly different question. Like you could draw a radius around anything. Um, and, and like you could draw a radius around the downtown area of Hyattsville where I live, and you're not going to get places that are within a two mile radius because Hyattsville goes up in, in really kind of crazy directions. Um, what I was wanting to know was whether or not, if, if this parcel was not in and, and being developed by um, the Bureau of Engraving, if it was, say, a, a private parcel, would it would the tax authority, the legal taxing jurisdiction, be the city of, of Greenbelt? Because um, that yeah. that that does Im- impact whether or not it would have authority or kind of input in this process. If it's no, we still appreciate the concerns. If it's yes, then then we should we should also kind of keep them in the loop as well. Well, it's not within any municipality, including the city of Greenbelt. So, okay. so that answer would be no. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, that would be no. Okay. Thank you. Um, was that it for you, Commissioner Dorner? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Geraldo. I have no questions, Madam Chair. Thank you for everybody who presented. Okay, um, thank you. Um, so is uh, Melissa Dostin on? I called her name a couple of times earlier and I don't see anyone who's signed in just by phone. So she's not on here. Okay. Um, well, let me say this too. We also have um, uh, letters. Um, we, I, as I indicated, we the Vanceville Citizens Association has spoken that we have um, um, Ms. Weschke, Weschke from the uh, Maryland Department of Commerce, and we have the letter from, of support from Karen Coakley in Beltsville. Um, it's an individual letter, not on behalf of the Beltsville Association. And also we have uh, an opponent's uh, letter from the, the West Law Citizens Association. And I wanted to, I, in reading the letters, I wanted to get to the um, one um, comment in the West Laurel letter, which is signed by uh, Ms. Dotson. And um, she she mentions in the letter that the planning staff has taken a position 
that the federal government does not have to abide by the Prince George's County zoning ordinance. Oh. It's, and I and I feel that we have to address that because it's not a mere taking a position. It, I, you know, it's my understanding, if I recall, it's the law, but I will turn to um, our principal counsel, David Warner, to address that comment for, for clarity, for purposes of clarity. Oh, sure. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. David Warner, principal counsel. Uh, no, you're correct. Um, the uh, the state's authority to, to uh, impose zoning and subdivision regulations um, is limited to the state's jurisdiction, and that's where we, the commission and the county, get any authority at all it has to zone and regulate a zone and subdivide property. So uh, we don't have the authority to zone and subdivide or impose zoning and subdivision controls on federal property. But uh, we do have a process that requires uh, property owners such as the federal government to go through this process they're going through right now, which is mandatory referral, where we nonetheless do review um, these development applications, uh, provide our recommendation. Uh, ultimately, they can choose not to go with our recommendation, but this process is a means for the public to have input on a project, and it's oftentimes very productive in getting to a final development uh, that is uh, uh, maybe better than uh, it would have been without this process. Thank you. And and so this mandatory referral process is also a creature of state law um, under the land use article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. And, and I think that um, you're so right in that in terms of they, any applicant, such as the federal government in this instance, they do not have to abide by our recommendations, but it is it does offer the citizens an opportunity and, and it gives them something to think about, to weigh our recommendations because we have so much experience in this, in this area. Um, so, so the process um, some people have asked sometimes, well, why bother if no one has to listen to you? They don't, they have to refer to us, but they don't have to abide by it. But if people are fair-minded and open-minded, they will want to hear what our comments are, at least weigh them. And so that's why we engage in this process. Um, and furthermore, whatever recommendation we make, it will be transmitted to the National Capital Planning Commission um, I know Mr. Acosta well, the executive director, and I would think that the the National Capital Planning Commission would be particularly attuned to the comments of the Maryland National Capital Market Planning Commission. So, um, so anyway, that is why um, I, I thank you for that recitation of the law because I think that was very important. It's not a um, discretionary thing. Uh, um, they do not. Um, well, that statement needed some clarity um, um, and you've provided it because the, the federal government does not have to listen to us and that so that's not a position that we're taking it's set forth in the law okay so um, if um, so I don't have any other speakers signed up at this time um, now I could go back as always the applicant has the ability and, and the right to close out so I could go back if you if you would like if anyone who wants to speak on behalf of the applicant, particularly Mr. Davis, I guess. Yes, Madam Chair. Um, the one thing I just wanted to point out is we are absolutely, you know, from day one, we have been, um, out, you know, providing community outreach to basically anybody who will listen to us. We we did have to take a pause during the EIS process. Um, just because we want to let that process um, play out, but we have absolutely every um, intent to, you know, uh, begin newsletters to the Vansville area, uh, you know, as part of our outreach to, of how the project is uh, progressing. And then I can also tell you that we do value um, your comments and, and concerns about the project. We have gone through the draft EIS and are in the process of revising that for a final EIS with with over 500 plus comments that we're um, incorporating into the EIS. And we're also, um, our design team also has um, been looking at a lot of the Prince George's County um, noise, light, landscape ordinances and, and planning documents that you um, 
have published and we're, um, as you've heard from our designer and, and as I've mentioned, you know, we're very much interested in complying with those to the greatest extent possible. So I just wanted to leave with that, that we, we are, we're not trying to, we're, we're, we're not, we're not doing this just to do it. You know, it's part of, it's part of the mandatory referral, but you know, we do want to hear your feedback and we have been hearing feedback all along, you know, such as the folks along Odell road. That's why we um, have a, um, you know, an emergency egress only, you know, uh, looking at the sounds that trucks might make or for deliveries. I mean, there's, there's a list of items that, you know, we're, we're in the process of evaluating as we go through the design to try and mitigate our presence. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Davis. So um, again, I had called on Melissa Dawson a few times. Um, I, I, she did not hear, but we do have her letter just uh, preserved in the record. So I just want to make that really clear. So let's see if the board has any questions of anyone. And if not, is if there's a motion, Ms. Ose, do you need, do you need to add anything else at this time? And what, when we're clear no. on your request? Okay. Okay. No, ma'am. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Does the, does the board have any questions of anyone? I see no um, questions, no raised hands, no comments. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move that we accept the recommendations of staff and approve the transmittal of MR-2101F to uh, Mr. Marcel Acosta with the National Capital Planning Commission. Second. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Uh, Madam Vice Chair. But I. Commissioner Washington. But I. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. And then Commissioner Geraldo. Vote aye, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. The ayes have it 5-0. Thank you everyone for your participation today. It counts. Um, how about we take a two minute break, two to three minute break and come back and we'll have item 10, 9, and 3A. Thank you. Okay. No one, oh, one more. Okay. The Prince George's County Planning Board is back in session. We are getting ready to take the next couple of cases. We're going to start with item 10, which is planning assistance to municipalities and communities, followed by item nine, followed by item 3A. So item 10, let's make sure we have everyone. Ms. Erminger, are you on? I am. Wonderful. Okay. And Mr. Stachura, are you on? He is out today. He's off today, just when I get his name right. Okay. All right. <laughs> Ms. Erminger, you are on. Okay. Um, good afternoon, members of the planning board. For the record, my name is Wendy Irvinger with the Neighborhood Revitalization Section of the Community Planning Division. I am here to request your approval of revisions to the guidelines and procedures that we use to administer the Planning Assistance to Municipalities and Communities Program known as PAMC. Next slide. The um, PAMC program has three distinct goals. They are to further the implementation of planning policy strategies and recommendations in our county's approved plans. They are to support the capacity building of community within communities through short-term projects that achieve our plan objectives and to capitalize on in-house planning expertise. Next slide. Examples of um, PAMC programs are um, varied. Um, they vary in type, uh, types and goals, and they are include but are not limited to uh, marketing and branding plans, economic studies, cultural resource inventories, streetscape designs, national register, historic district nominations, and projects like that. Here are a few examples. We've had 14 projects funded since 2018. 
10 of these are still ongoing. By the end of this fiscal year, four of those will be completed and we anticipate four new projects will be presented to you for funding. Next slide. The revisions that we're asking you to approve today include um, allowing us to procure consultant services earlier in the project approval process. So you will have the exact cost of the project when staff presents it to you for funding. The next revision increases the per project maximum from $50,000 to $65,000. Next, we change the acceptance of applications to a rolling basis rather than twice a year as it is now. The rolling basis is more practical until we have a greater volume of applications. We needed to update the preferential policy areas stated in the guidelines by deleting references to TNI or transformative neighborhood initiative areas and adding business improvement districts. Next uh, guideline was added to ensure that an applicant doesn't have more than one PAMC project going on at the same time because we aim to disperse these projects throughout the county. And lastly, to ensure that applicants have the backing of the entire organization that they represent especially when they're not um, 501c3 uh, organizations, um, we ask that they submit minutes from the meeting where they voted to apply to the PAMC program. Next slide. Um, so today we are asking um, for your vote um, to approve these guidelines as presented to you today. And I'm of course here for um, answering any questions. This concludes staff's presentation. Okay, thank you, Ms. Erminger. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Um, Madam Vice Chair. She's muted. She's muted. Thank you, thank you. Good work, thank you. Okay, I, I, uh, Commissioner Washington. No questions, but thank you, Ms. Erminger. Okay. Um, Commissioner Dorner. No questions. Thank you for, for this. I, I think the, um, the planning and assistance that we provide is, is great. We have super dedicated and professional staff that have just crazy specializations that are really useful that smaller municipalities and groups can't access. They, they just don't have the resources. And it's really nice that we're able to give back to the local communities and help them um, in this way. So thank you. Yes, indeed. And, and Commissioner Gerardo. Yes, thank you, Ms. Erbinger and, and all of the staff for revitalizing the communities in our county. That work is really appreciated. Sometimes you guys are in the background, but we start seeing the results. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And it's also reminding me I better head back into Vigilante Coffee and get me some good coffee there. Okay. Um, yes, you did. We have a new barbecue place opening this noon too. Okay, that Please works too. Stop talk about food. Yeah, that works. <laughs> Is there a motion? <laughs> Madam Chair, I enthusiastically move that we accept the uh, recommendation of staff and approve the revisions to the uh, 2021 PMAC guidelines and procedures. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Washington, seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Madam Vice Chair. But I. Commissioner Washington. But I. Commissioner Dorner. But I. Commissioner Geraldo. But I, Madam Chair, thank you. The ayes have it, 5-0. Thank you so much, Ms. Erminger. Thank you. Um, okay, next we have item nine, which is preliminary plan of subdivision 4-19011, the towns at Brandywine Crossing. Let's make sure we have everyone. Ms. Gupta. Okay, there you are. Okay, wonderful. Mr. Haller, Mr. Haller. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I'm present. Okay, wonderful. Mr. Bickle. I'm present. Mr. Lenhart. Present. Um, we have um, additional backup. We have um, your parcel A exhibit, um, applicants exhibit number one. And we have applicants proposed revised conditions, which would be applicant exhibit number two. Um, and therefore, Ms. Ms. Gupta, you are on. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. 
For the record, my name is Muridula Gupta, Planning Coordinator with the Subdivision Section. Item number nine on the agenda is a preliminary plan of subdivision for towns at Brandywine Crossing 4-19011. The subject property consists of three parcels, which are to be subdivided into 170 lots and 23 parcels for the development of 170 single family attached dwellings on 18.58 acres. Next slide, please. Slide two is, I'm, excuse me. The site is located in the southern part of Prince George's County within planning area 85A and council district nine. Slide three, please. More specifically, the site is located approximately a quarter mile east of the intersection of US 301 and Mattapeak Business Drive. Slide four, please. The site is located in light industrial I-1 zone. The properties directly to the north and south are located in the MXT and I-1 zone respectively. The other adjacent zones are the CSC and I-2 zones. Slide five, please. The aerial photograph shows the site, which consists of three existing parcels, which were previously cleared and graded. A regional stormwater management pond is located in the northeast corner of the site, and another regional stormwater management pond is located immediately to the south. The property is flanked to the east by a floodplain associated with the Timothy branch and is bound to the west by the Mattapeak Business Drive right away with the Brandywine Shopping Center beyond. Slide six, please. The site map shows the topography on the, on the site, which is essentially flat and slopes eastwards towards the two stormwater dimension ponds. Slide seven, please. The master plan right away map shows the major collector NC-503 highlighted in blue located west of the site. US 301 Crane Highway is highlighted in orange and the arterial A55, that is the Matter Woman Drive, is shown here in red. Next slide, please. This slide shows the locations in which the applicant proposes off-site pedestrian and bicycle improvements. These improvements include crosswalks and sidewalk upgrades. Staff finds these facilities proffered by the applicant and those recommended by staff will meet the bicycle and pedestrian adequacy requirements. Slide nine, please. The critical intersections analyzed by staff are circled here in red and green. The intersections of Maryland 5 US 301 at Timothy Branch Drive and MD5 US 301 at Climber Drive, Metapeak Business Drive, shown here to the left of the slide, will operate at an in inadequate level of service given the proposed development. Consequently, staff is recommending a fee payment to the Brandywine Road Club as a means of addressing adequacy of transportation facilities as further detailed on page 11 of the staff report. Next slide, please. This overall view of the preliminary plan of subdivision shows the proposed layout of 170 lots and road circulation in light blue. The townhouse sticks are highlighted in red. The site is accessed from Mattapeak Business Drive, which is shown here in purple, at two locations one each at both ends of the site. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, and rescue facilities are available to serve the subject site. Police response times are not adequate for the site. However, a capital improvement program includes a new station for Police District 5, in which the site is located. Therefore, mitigation is not required. The master plan of transportation calls for the development of a planned hard surface hiker, biker, equestrian trail 
known as the Timothy Branch Trail along the eastern portion of the subject property. This trail has been shifted to Matterpeak Business Drive to match up with the trail segments planned for residential development to the north, including the new Timothy Branch community. This application indicates that the 15-foot easement located along the Timothy Branch Stream Valley along the eastern boundary of the site is proposed to be extinguished. Instead, an eight-foot wide path is located along the entire frontage of Matapeak Business Drive, which will provide to, uh, to accommodate the master plan trail. Staff finds that shifting the Timothy Branch Trail along the site's frontage will provide the pedestrian connectivity sought by the recommended trail, while not impacting environmental features associated with the stream valley. Next slide, please. The applicant's exhibit provided a breakdown of unit types, parking, sidewalks, and conceptual recreation facilities. These features, as well as the design of townhouse units, will be further evaluated at the TSP stage. The site's pedestrian circulation system can be seen here in further detail. Sidewalks, highlighted in blue, are planned on both sides of the internal streets, as well as providing connections to the on-site recreation areas, the Stormwater Pond to the right, and the Brandywine Crossing Shopping Center situated across uh, the Magic Business Drive to the left. The applicant has proposed private on-site recreation facilities to address the mandatory parkland dedication requirement. These facilities may include accessible green space and open play areas with walking paths and benches, a clubhouse, and a fitness studio. Staff evaluated the adequacy of the proffered recreation facilities in accordance with the Prince George's County Parks and Recreation Facilities Guidelines and found the proposal satisfactory. The siting and the details of the recreation facilities will be further evaluated during the review of the DSP. The proposed woodland conservation area is shown here in dark green. The hashed area to the right depicts the previous, previously recorded floodplain buffer area for Timothy Branch. Next slide, please. The type, two, uh, type 1 tree conservation plan shows the 0.5 acres of environmental regulated features known as primary management area highlighted here in pink. This primary management area consists of both the floodplain associated with the Timothy Branch Creek and, and steep slopes. No impacts are proposed to the primary management area. The woodland preservation and reforestation areas are highlighted here in light green. Next slide, next slide please. Since publishing of the staff report, the applicant has proposed to preserve the 0.19 acres of existing woodland, which, which were previously being impacted. Um, and the applicant proposes to do it by revising the layout of the lots located in the southern eastern portion of the site. The project will thus retain the entire existing on-site woodlands, a forest and additional 0.25 acres on-site, and meet the remaining woodland conservation requirements off-site. Staff finds the revised layout acceptable, given that the applicant intends to preserve 100% of the existing woodlands and widen the conservation buffer along Timothy Branch. Next slide, please. This slide discusses the issue of the proposed right-of-way dedication along Matapeak Business Drive. The current road was developed as a four-lane undivided road within a 70-foot right-of-way to serve industrial zone properties. The master plan rezone several sites adjoining the subject property to the MXT zone and upgraded Matapeak Business Drive to a major collector facility, which requires a 100-foot right-of-way, which is shown here in red. The master plan road MC503 continues after the roundabout in a south southeasterly direction, also shown here in red, to link up to Matawoman Drive a master plan arterial road. 
The applicant proposes to dedicate only five feet of additional right of way along Mattapee Business Drive, shown here in blue. The reduced right of way will result in an 80 foot urban collector roadway. The road cross, section, road cross sections shown to the right depict the eventual build out for Mattapee Business Drive for an 80 foot right of way road and a hundred foot right of way road. The essential difference between the two is the introduction of a 20 foot wide median for a hundred foot wide major collector road, which provides space for pedestrian refuge and, and to accommodate turning lanes where required. The subdivision staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve the preliminary plan of subdivision 4-19011 and Type 1 Tree Conservation Plan TCP1-023-2020 subject to the 22 conditions in the staff report. The applicant has submitted uh, two exhibits. The first exhibit, uh, which are the exhibits are located in the additional backup. The first one, which shows the five foot right of way, which was dedicated along Mattapeak Business Drive or preliminary plan of subdivision 4-16013, which was approved by the planning board in July of 2017 for subdivision of a property for development of multifamily dwellings. The applicant's exhibit also includes an aerial map and a zoning map for the subject property, which is located further north of uh, this site, along the same east side of Mattapeak Business Drive. During the hearing for preliminary plan 4-16013, the planning board approved dedication by plan of five foot wide right of way and creation of a 10 foot wide parcel to be dedicated upon demand for future widening of the road. The applicant also submitted revisions to staff's recommended conditions of approval. This is exhibit number two. This document is uh, uh, specifically, the applicant has suggested revisions to recommended conditions 1G, 1I, 86, 8, and 19C, D, and E. In consideration of planning board's previous approval for PPS 4-16013 for a similar right of way dedication along Mattapeak Business Drive, staff reviewed the uh, Staff reviewed the suggested revisions. Staff has since discussed the revisions with the applicant and has come to an, come into an agreement with the language of the revised recommended conditions. The applicant will be presenting the proposed revisions to the recommended conditions later during this hearing. In line with the revised recommended conditions of 1G and 8, Staff will also revise finding seven of the staff report, specifically uh, the transportation section on master plan and site access. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you, Ms. Gupta. Um, let's see if there are any questions from you at this time. And, 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 um, and thank you for your exhibit, um, your slide 14, because that wasn't in my packet, I think, and that helps me understand a couple of things too. Um, so let's see if there are any questions. Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Well done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, oh, Commissioner Washington. No questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Gupta. Okay. Commissioner Dorner. Yeah, I have a question about, um, the bike path. So I know that we took the Timothy, um, branch trail and we're moving it over to, um, the east side of the, of the Mattapeak Bay or business drive. Um, what I can't tell, I, so I think it's going to be basically that blue line that's on this slide and, and follow that up, um, correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, but what I can't tell on the right of way maps to, to the right of that is whether or not the bike lanes are, are going to be a shared space um, on the sidewalks that are going to be those eight foot wide sidewalks or if they're actually going to be in the road. Um, because there's a there's a strike through of the bike lanes. Like my my reading of the staff report was that they were going to be on the sidewalks and be kind of a shared path. Um, but when when I saw this um, 
the Irving Collector Road um, kind of drawings, I, I wasn't sure if maybe we were going to try and put them on the road instead. Uh, yes, Commissioner. I I was trying to use the standard cross section that DPWT uses, and I was trying to uh, reflect that we are in fact we'll have a shared path eight feet wide outside the uh, the normal uh, pavement section of the road. So it'll be protected, and it'll be um, it'll be a combined shared path eight feet wide. Okay, and then are we, um, yeah, yeah. So that, that definitely answers. I, I like the bike paths when they're when there's more protection or just pedestrian paths in general. Um, the, the sharrows that are on the roads are, are nice, but they don't always get cleaned up, and and it's still a little bit dangerous sometimes. Um, is there going to be any kind of a a marking on these paths? And this might be a question for Mr. Haller um, that would designate kind of like the the direction, because when if you start to get people walking and riding on the sidewalks. Um, it would be nice just to have at least a little bit of distinction um, so they don't they don't kind of run head on. Uh, right now, the, sec the uh, requirement is for this uh, shared path on one side of the road. And uh, this the signage will be reviewed further at the DSP stage. Okay, so maybe Mr. Haller can talk about whether or not it's going to be, I don't know if it's wide enough to have kind of people going in both directions, um, kind of continuously, like it would be a trail of that nature or if it's just kind of a wide sidewalk. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll punt that to him um, and he can he can talk a little bit more about that. And that, that's it on my questions. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Gerardo. I, I have no questions, but thank you, Mr. Okay. All right. So let's see who uh, who else we have here. Mr. If there are no other questions, Mr. Haller, we have. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, this is Thomas Haller. I'm an attorney with offices in Largo and I'm representing the applicant today. Um, I did want to mention that uh, although Ms. Gupta is a, a relatively new uh, person for park and planning, um, I just want to say that she's done a great job uh, acclimating to uh, to her role at uh, in the subdivision office, and I've enjoyed working with her immensely on this and other projects. So I just wanted to uh, to thank her for her assistance uh, in in working through the issues on this case. Um, I do want to uh, just start by giving a little bit of a brief a brief background about this property, um, just because when you look at the zoning map and you see it's I one and we're proposing residential development, it may it make you scratch your head a little bit. But as the board is aware. Uh, this whole area of Brandywine uh, was originally slated back in the 80s and 90s as an industrial development area. Um, in fact, this property was at one time part of a larger mining activity. And then um, Brandywine Crossing uh, started to transition the area into more of a retail area. And as you can see, um, all of the property on the west side of Mattapique Business Drive uh, is owned commercial. And so when the master plan was uh, proposed back in 2009, it recommended that all of the land on the east side of Mattapique Business Drive remain in the uh, I-1 zone uh, and stay industrial. And, and in fact, it was adopted in that manner. Um, but then, uh, as you recall, the 2009 uh, master plan and sectional map amendment uh, ended up being reversed in court and uh, the, came back to the county council. And when the county council readopted uh, the master plan and sectional map amendment back in 2013, they rezoned the property north of, of the property that's before you today to the MXT zone on the east side of Mattapique Business Drive, but they did not zone this property. So what you ended up with uh, on the southern end of Mattapique Business Drive was uh, a parcel of property in the I-1 zone uh, that um, where everything else was either commercial or, or MXT. And so it created this situation where the, the owner was put in an awkward situation. Do I, do I try to find a warehouse or I, do I find some other industrial use for the property or do I seek something that uh, is more compatible with the direction that the Brandywine Center is going? And, uh, and so as a result of that in, uh, 2018, 
uh, the council adopted CR 62 that allows um, residential development in limited circumstances in the I-1 zone. And this property um, qualifies for that residential development, uh, which, will, which will be far more consistent with the uh, ultimate zoning for this area because the, uh, the general plan designated this as a center and the proposed zoning through the uh, countywide map amendment would place this property into an activity center zone that would allow residential development. So um, rather than uh, putting the property owner in a position where they had no choice but to pursue industrial development or wait until the comprehensive rezoning was approved, uh, the property was allowed to move forward with this uh, development. And because of that, uh, Folger Pratt is the contract purchaser for the property and they are the ones that are proposing to construct this, uh, this residential community. So um, with that background, just so that the board had better understanding of that, um, I did want to also uh, respond to Commissioner Derner's comment. Um, I think that uh, the details of how this uh, path gets uh, signed and designated or striped can be worked out at the time of detailed site plan. We would be open to a, a, a finding uh, to have that to be addressed at the time of detailed site plan. Um, as you uh, know, and as the staff mentioned, uh, there were originally plans to place a trail on the east side of the property um, adjacent to the uh, floodplain. Um, but after many years of consideration, it was determined that uh, the Department of Parks and Recreation did not want that trail and the obligation and maintenance of that trail and recommended that the path be moved uh, to Mattapeak Business Drive. So. Uh, we will be constructing that path as part of the development of this property and um, uh, as well as several other pedestrian oriented improvements, crosswalks and whatnot in, uh, in relationship to this development. So, but, uh, but I appreciate that comment. And I think that that's an issue that we probably need to take a closer look at at the time of detail. Um, the, the only other comment that I wanted to make is that we have, we have worked with staff uh, with regard to the treatment of the uh, proposed right of way and the dedication and uh, the board will remember that we were before you about three years ago on the property to the north of this, not immediately into the north, but, but can, uh, Mr. Haller, can we, Mr. Haller, can you guide um, uh, Mr. Flanagan here to the property oh. that you're referring to now? Oh, sure. So if you, uh, uh, if, if you, if you look at the property in purple immediately to the north of the subject mm -hmm. property, that is an existing developed, um, commercial building um, and that uh, property um, was developed several years ago was then later placed in the MXT zone after it was developed. The property north of that um, was the property that was before you three years ago called Union Park and that is a 312 multifamily dwelling uh, complex um, that is um, that has been approved as an approved detailed site plan now and you will recall that we were before you uh, at that time addressing the right of way requirements along Mattapeak Business Drive. And we uh, agreed to a dedication of five feet uh, to allow for the construction of this eight foot side path and, uh, and, and the preservation of existing land in a separate parcel uh, should the Department of Permitting Inspections and Enforcement ever decide uh, that the roadway needed to be widened. And okay, so Mr. Hallett, stop for a second. Stop for a second. Can, stop for, can we go to slide three? maybe and um and so so there we go so right above so you see the commercial building right there right correct so the building that's uh depicted immediately to the north of this property right. is the commercial building that i told you about that was constructed prior to being placed in the mxt zone and the property immediately north of that is the property in which the union right. park uh, development is oh, proposed no, no. yeah okay thank you so what we are, what we have proposed here is a, is a consistent uh, treatment uh, for both properties along the east side of Mattapeak Business Drive. So with, with that background, I do uh, as as uh, staff indicated, we submitted proposed revisions to conditions uh, which we have worked through with staff, and we do have a revised uh, set of conditions. Unfortunately, the set that was placed in your backup is not the right set. So if it might be possible for me to uh, share my screen, I can go, I can show you the conditions which we have agreed to with staff and can then, um, uh, that would be a lot easier for the board to understand what modifications are being proposed. Okay, we're gonna allow that here. Mr. Flanagan is working on that with you. 
before you. Okay. And, and um, if you do have the revised conditions that were in the backup, I can explain to you where, where the changes uh, from what we originally submitted are uh, proposed. That's trying to share a screen is what he's trying to do. Okay. Okay, there we go. Oh, now I see you all. So I think we gave you, yeah, there we go. Oh, so, so you can see that? Uh, no, see we cannot. We need to make it larger, please. Yes. Uh, I can see anything. Considerably larger. Uh -oh. <laughs> is it because his screen is turned? What is that off thing? Right oh, there? He just it's makes the document. Go down to the bottom right where you see the little scale. Oh, yeah, I see it. There you yeah, go. Move, move it closer to 100. Okay. Yeah. That's not, okay. Now we go. Well, let's, okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> That yeah. work. I was having a hard time seeing it too, so I yeah. <laughs> thank you for explaining to me how to do that. I'm not sure I could have gotten there. Myself. You're welcome. So, so the um, uh, in our in the uh, in the backup that was given to you, we had proposed revisions to condition one G, and we have worked through that with staff to come up with the mechanism uh, for the uh, revision to to the condition to implement the dedication of the right-of-way along Mattapique Business Drive. And so, as I said, um, uh, in, in consistent with what was done a couple of years ago on the Union Park property, um, this condition one gene now specifies that we will create a 10-foot parcel um, in, in width and as well as a five-foot dedication and that the 10-foot parcel would be reserved in perpetuity and dedicated to DPI on demand in the future. So um, that, that revision to con con condition G uh, is different than what we had originally proposed, but this is the condition we've now worked out with staff. Um, in condition one I, uh, we had originally proposed to remove that condition uh, and with further conversation with staff are modifying it now, as you see, on the screen in front of you. Uh, the only change now to condition 1i that would be proposed is to change the 10 foot width to seven feet um, to um, address staff's concern with regard to condition 1i. Uh, the next revision is to um, condition six. Um, and that has to do with um, uh, pro providing certain uh, pedestrian details on the detailed site plan. And this is just a minor rewording to make sure that we were all in agreement as to exactly how that was going to be presented as part of the detailed site plan. And I believe that uh, staff and the applicant are both in agreement on that. Um, the next revision is to condition eight. And again, that goes to the implementation of the um, mechanism for implementing the right of way dedication and the reservation of the parcel. So the first part of condition eight says at the time of final plat, the applicant will dedicate the five foot of right of way um, along Mattapique Business Drive. Condition 8B uh, provides for the uh, provision of a note on the plat consistent with the prior case uh, where that right of way will be retained in private ownership and dedicated upon demand. Um, and then um, in our proposed revisions to condition eight, we had added some additional language um, with, to, to implement the uh, future dedication and that's now been added as condition 23 at the back of the uh, proposed conditions. So con proposed condition 23 provides that after the development of the 170 townhouses, the applicant will convey the, the, the right of way to the county upon demand. And then uh, the final revisions to the conditions are back to condition 19 and, um, and uh, which, are, which you can see conditions 19 C, D and E uh, and one of the exhibits that staff showed you was there was an original area of tree preservation on site. And we had, uh, original proposal had uh, been to remove some of the on-site woodlands. Uh, this property was cleared years ago under prior tree conservation plan. And uh, staff expressed a desire that we, that we preserve all of the existing woodlands on site. And so we are proposing to revise the plan to do that and, and in addition to plant some additional trees on site to widen the buffer adjacent to the floodplain and these revisions to the conditions in 19 C, D and E uh, would implement those revisions to the plan.
So with th that would be the total uh, substance of the uh, proposed revisions to the uh, to the to the conditions that's before you. And um, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have with regard to any of those proposed revisions. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Haller. Um, uh, I think this um, is a good compromise. Okay. And and there's a precedent. Um, let's see what happens if there are other questions. Um, Madam Vice Chair. No questions. Excuse me. No, I thought I heard somebody else speaking. Uh, I, I don't have any, well, one clarifying question. Um, Ms. Gupta, you mentioned, uh, well, first of all, are you in agreement with what Mr. Howler just presented by way of revised conditions? And then if so, the only change you would uh, need to make is uh, with regards to uh, finding number seven. I believe that's how I understand your com understood your comments. Uh, yes, Commissioner. Uh, so this, uh, the revised conditions that uh, Mr. Haller is presenting is after extensive discussion between staff and uh, him as well as the engineer. And uh, the only thing that's not referenced here is uh, due to the revised findings of 1G and 8, uh, we will be revising finding, uh, finding 8 in our staff report. Okay, now I'm I, seven. I'm sorry. Oh, I apologize. Okay. Finding seven. Okay, I was making good notes. I wanted to make sure I was right. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, and, and let me and let me elaborate on that because what what depending on how the motion goes, if because I know that um, um, Ms. Gupta, you're in agreement with this. Uh, so we will um, when the resolution comes back to the findings will then be there for the board to um, consistent with a motion. So for the so um, the board will then adopt the findings. Is I just want to make sure that the, there will ultimately be our findings, the board's findings. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Okay. No more um, okay. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. No, no questions. I look forward to seeing um, what comes up at the the DSP, assuming that the vote goes in favor for for the path and stuff. Okay, and Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, Commissioner Washington uh, asked a question that I had. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I don't have anyone else, I don't believe, signed up to speak, uh, unless they're just for questions. Mr. Bickle and Mr. Lenhart, you're here to answer any questions, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, wonderful. Um, so if the board has no other questions of anyone, Ms. Gupta, do you have anything else to add? Or Mr. Haller, anything else to add? Or we're going for it. No, I have nothing else to add. Okay, that sounds like it's motion time. Let's go to our leap year, baby. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff in addition to um, 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 asking staff to work with council and ensuring a revised finding to condition, excuse me, finding number seven uh, and approve preliminary plan 4-19011 and TCP1-02 TCP1 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and the following conditions as revised per the presentation by Mr. Howler uh, to conditions 1G, 1I, condition six, condition eight, condition 19C, condition 19D, 19E, and new condition number 23. Wow. Second. <laughs> we have a motion and we have a, we and by by Commissioner Washington and we have a second by Vice Chair Bailey. Madam Vice Chair. Uh vote aye and aye for the motion maker. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um um motion maker. Um I vote aye. I vote aye. <laughs> okay. Probably to both. Okay. And <laughs> And Commissioner Dorner. 
Aye. And Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay, the ayes have it five zero. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Hightower. We have item 3A, which is legislation CB9 2021. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Before beginning uh, my presentation to you, uh, to uh, the, the planning Hi, board. Good, good, yes, good afternoon. I would like to notify you that the bill sponsor is not moving forward with this uh, light, with this legislation. It's no longer needed. Uh, the County Council Committee of the Whole this morning voted 11 uh, zero to hold the bill in committee indefinitely. On Monday, planning department staff sent comments on the proposed legislation to the county council for, uh, so for their deliberations. Staff can continue to discuss this legislation if you would like. But well, uh, it is they're they're not okay. if they're holding it, they probably have a, a reason and it will likely come back. And it, if it comes back at all, it'll come back differently, most likely. You think? Well, it's no longer needed, is what okay. the bill sponsor okay. well, we don't. Then, then guess what else we don't need? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but, it is good to see, but it is good to see you, Ms. Hightower. Presentation. I client. Yes. You thank just, you. So amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's good to see you, Ms. Hightower. So thank that, you. That leads me to um, two things. First of all, as we close out, um, well, you know what? That first, that leads me to Mr. Hunt. Mr. Hunt. Yes, Madam Chair. Is there any additional business to come before this board today on March 4th, 2021? There are no additional business items before the board today. Thank you very much. I'm about to hit this gavel, but before I do, we are gonna close out again. Um, Peter Goldsmith, wherever you are, we wish you a happy birthday again, and we certainly wish a happy birthday to our uh, leap year baby, Shawnee's Commissioner Shawnee's Washington. And again, we close out with, with happy Women's History Month and happy International Women's Day to everyone. And please stay safe. Um, it's good to see you even virtually, but stay safe. This ain't over. Stay kind and um, just have a fabulous, wonderful weekend. And planning board is adjourned. Thank you, Madam. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Madam. We did it. Our double board. We did it.